Welcome to the podcast, Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path. And I'm your host, Mike Allen. You know, when you drive around the state of Connecticut, you see lots of beautiful open space, but most of that land, believe it or not, is privately held and it could be developed. Well, today we're going to take a look at the unheralded groups, land trusts, that work throughout the state in the local communities to set aside open space so we'll have it to enjoy for the future. The oldest one of those land trusts in Connecticut in Newtown is turning 100 this year. Our guest today is Amy Blaymore Patterson, Executive Director of the Connecticut Land Conservation Council. It's an organization that supports and helps coordinate land trusts statewide. Now, believe it or not, Connecticut is far behind its target goals of setting aside land, and Amy's going to be along in just a moment to tell us all about it. This week's trivia question, if you were a potential military recruit and you went to see Connecticut's Dr. Beckwith, odds are you were looking for a medical excuse not to go to war. Which war are we talking about? We'll stick around after the main program for the answer because then you'll know the topic for next week's show. Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path is brought to you by our sponsor, Yale New Haven Health. When people need the best quality health care, there's a reason they turn to Yale New Haven Health. In 1826, Yale New Haven Hospital became Connecticut's very first hospital. They were the first hospital in the U.S. to use chemotherapy. Yale New Haven was the first to introduce insulin pumps for diabetic patients, and they introduced the world's first intensive care unit for newborns. For more information about Yale New Haven Health, visit YNHHS.org. That's YNHHS.org. There's an old saying that I think is particularly appropriate for today's episode, and it goes something like this. If you want to see where you have been, look at your current situation. Now, if you want to see where you're going, look at your current activities. Well, the topic of land conservation is interesting in that in terms of humankind's overall history, it's a small blip in that timeline. That makes sense because there was always plenty of land on Earth who needed to conserve it. Obviously, that has changed, and our species started to truly wake up to this issue a little more than a century ago. That's when President Theodore Roosevelt started the National Park System, setting aside great swaths of wilderness for future generations to enjoy and appreciate. The first private, nonprofit group in the entire country that was dedicated to setting aside land for the future was based in Massachusetts, and it was called the Trustees of Reservations. They formed in 1890, not that long ago, about 130 years ago. Their idea was simple, preserve the countryside with its fresh air, scenic beauty, and opportunities to simply get away from it all, similar to how a library preserves books and a museum preserves art. Five years later, in 1895, Connecticut got into the act. They set up the Connecticut Forest and Park Association. It's a group that still exists. It's in Middlefield, and it's dedicated to preserving forest land throughout the state and educating all the rest of us about the importance of preserving forest land. Meanwhile, the concept of a land trust didn't really start in Connecticut until 100 years ago this year. 1924, the Newtown Forest Association was established to preserve local land. Well, today, Connecticut's got about 125 land trusts throughout the state. Now, an important milestone occurred in 1997. That's when the Connecticut legislature passed a law that actually set a goal to put aside one-fifth of the land in the state, 21%, for future generations. And it set out to do it by 2023, giving the state 25 years to do it. Now, 10% of that 21% was supposed to come from the state government. The other 11% was going to come from land trusts and municipalities, other conservation organizations, and even water companies. Well, it didn't happen. We missed the target, and now a new timeline is being established. In the meantime, in 2006, this is the last date I'll give you, a new organization came on the scene in the state, the Connecticut Land Conservation Council. They wear a number of hats, but their key role is to coordinate among all the multiple groups, especially the state's land trusts, to grow the amount of land that is set aside. Amy Blaymore Patterson was hired as the first executive director of CLCC more than a decade ago, and she's the only one who's ever held the post, and she's made considerable progress. 
Among her focal points, she's trying to just get more accurate data collected on the number of acres actually set aside for conservation, as well as come to an agreement among all the towns and cities in the state on uniform definitions for something seemingly as simple as open space. She's also keenly aware of the global push to preserve 30% of the Earth's land by 2030 and 50% of the land by 2050. Now, Amy, let's start off with really the basics. What is a land trust and why are land trusts important? They are community-based nonprofits, and their whole mission is to permanently protect and steward land for public benefit. They are in the best position at the very local level to build these relationships with landowners over generations. They can build networks with people. They connect at the grassroots level. And as nonprofits, you know, they can access financing that government entities might not be able to do. Is it fair to say that local land trusts, being local, really understand what those needs are in terms of what needs to be conserved locally? Sort of, you know, think globally, act locally? Absolutely. You know, I always say to people, you know, when they have a question about Where are the important places in their community to protect and why is start with your local land trust. They have that feel, they have that sense. And, you know, so much of why they got into being in land, the folks that I'm talking about that are part of those land trusts is because of that sense and feel for the land. When you talk about land and you talk about wetlands, I think we all drive in our car and we, you know, drive by wetlands every single day and they tend to be undeveloped because they're wet. And I think we all sort of just jump to the conclusion that, oh, well, then they're going to be wet forever and always every and develop that. But with modern technology, they can drain it. They can get exemptions to drain land and build on it. And we've seen a lot of this disappear over the years, haven't we? Absolutely. And Connecticut is no exception. Um, You know, the statistics are pretty staggering here in Connecticut. Between inland and coastal wetlands, we have lost a significant amount. And it's really interesting with wetlands. I have to say, you know, before I started in my nonprofit career, I was a land use attorney and I did a lot of work before wetlands commissions. And one thing that people don't realize here in Connecticut is that we define wetlands as soil type by statute, and that's how they are delineated. And so oftentimes people think, well, that area is too wet, you can't develop it. And to your point, Mike, I always say you can't rely upon the way it looks because engineering is pretty advanced now. And where there's a will, there's often a way. There are ways to get around the regulatory constraints through engineering. And sometimes that can work, but sometimes it can't. And what it has resulted in is a lot of areas have been filled. And also watercourses, of course, have been impacted as well by development. I'd love to get your opinion as an attorney on the following concept. And that is simply, you know, is land here to help us or are we here to help the land? And what I mean by that is, if you go back to the almost 400 years now that Connecticut has had European uh, settlers and who treated the land obviously much differently than the indigenous natives who were here, uh, you think about Connecticut was essentially denuded of trees, by, you know, the end of the 1700s into the 1800s, which was used, you know, first of all, clear it for farming, second of all, build houses, you know, burn wood, also the things we used wood for was a huge natural resource. And I think that there's this feeling that, you know, we could, we could conquer the land. Well, now when we look at climate change and biodiversity and what lives on the land that we need to rely on to survive as a species ourselves, Where do you come down on this? You know, how important is the land versus civilization, civilization versus land? So that's a pretty profound question, Mike. (laughs) And I would say I'm going to start with the, the way you phrased it at first, which is, is the land here to help us? And I would say emphatically, yes, it absolutely is. And, you know, there are so many benefits to conserving land, both in the short term and in the long term. I always say that, you know, Conserving land is a good investment. It provides measurable ecosystem services that enhance our, our, our local and statewide economies. And, you know, I have a laundry list of why land is here to help us. 
but at the end of the day, for many of the reasons that you stated through your question, you know, we're here to help the land as well. And, and conserving it is, of course, the primary way that we can help land. Well, I also want to get your opinion on something else. I, I drive all over the state of Connecticut as I do this podcast, and I think there's a deceptive issue here. I see so much open space as I'm driving along in beautiful green areas and where I had to have a, a wake-up call and pinch myself getting ready for this episode was that, yeah, there's a lot of open space, but a lot of it's in private hands and not dedicated for conservation set aside for the future. So could you speak to that for a second, roughly how much of our land is actually set aside and how much is not? Right now, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, DEEP, which is our state agency that oversees our land, is in the process of revising the state's green plan or its open space acquisition strategy document. One of the starting points there is how do we define open space? Town by town, what is considered open space may differ. Much of the land is not legally conserved. It's not expressly restricted for conservation uh, with any kind of right of enforcement. So I think it starts there, which is how are we even defining open space? So yeah, it might look open and it might look like it's conserved land, but it's not necessarily so. Connecticut is heavily forested with about ranges about between 59 and 61 percent of the land is identified as forest. But of that, over 70 percent is in private ownership with no protection. So to your point, it is very deceptive. You, I imagine, are in the middle of a very tricky situation because there are so many groups historically and currently that sort of have a toe in this water. There are watershed protection groups. There are, of course, all the local land trusts, which you're trying to coordinate. There's the state government. There's just so many. I could go on and on and on. Connecticut chapters of national organizations. And your group, the Connecticut Land Conservation Council, has only been involved in this for the last 20 years. And I can imagine what a headache to walk in and say, where do you even start? How do you approach that? You know, it's funny. I love that element of the job. And I think what really um, appealed to me when I was offered the position as the first executive director of CLCC, and that was in 2010, was this opportunity to really build relationships at the state level, is building relationships between land trusts, between land trusts and watershed groups. And there's just so much potential there through collaboration to have an even greater impact on land conservation and the environment. So that part of the job, I never looked at it as a burden. I look at it as a tremendous opportunity. And it's really part of the joy of doing this work for me is to build those relationships, see them flourish and see what impacts are happening as a result of those collaborative types of relationships. It's really at the core of everything that we do at CLCC. And what we are doing now, and, and land trusts are really embracing this, is taking those relationships and going beyond building relationships between conservation groups and looking at relationship building with other community groups and starting to have conversations about how land trusts are better fitting into communities as community organizations and going beyond just being seen as focused only on land conservation as their primary role, but really looking at how land trusts can be seen in communities as better partners and helping to address community needs through their mission of conserving land. Now, as we said earlier, European settlers have been in Connecticut for almost 400 years, and yet the oldest land trust in the state of Connecticut in this year, which is 2024 as we're speaking, is only 100 years old, and that's in Newtown, you know, it's had its fits and starts over the century trying to, you know, sustain itself, but it's it's going great guns now. And, you know, when you look around the state and you have that great sort of bird's eye perspective in your role to be able to look at all the land trusts in the state, let's start off with, does every town have a land trust? And if not, why not? Not every town in Connecticut has a land trust, but I would say that uh, most towns have a land trust, and if not in their own town, there is a regional land trust. So why not? You know, that's a hard question to answer. It's easier to say why most do. For probably the last 75 years or so, land conservation really rested with our government entities. So, and they did a pretty, a pretty good job of land conservation. But, you know, as you had alluded to earlier, you know, when you start to get into the 70s and 80s, 
and even really before that, with the emergence of the environmental movement, uh, we saw a rise in the establishment of land trusts during that period of time. It was very grassroots oriented and it was very reflective of the environmental movement. So most towns started to rally around environmental issues and land trusts were created as a result. I was going to propose that maybe one of the reasons they don't is all of the very difficult work that's involved. And and these are volunteers. I'm not sure everybody's aware of that. I mean, there are a couple of land trusts that have been fortunate enough to hire professional staff. It's not just getting into the community and identifying which land should be preserved, but then getting it preserved, which is a lot of legal and tax questions. Uh, and then it's maintaining the land afterwards in a you know a biodiversity manner, which means you need some expertise in this area. It's education, it's fundraising. There is so much work to, to these land trusts. I'm not sure that's a reason why they don't start. I think they start and then again, they, they became um, in existence through the will of individuals who really cared about their own community and the environment around it. But I think it's more about sustaining them. (laughs) The factors that you just identified really, I think, come into play, again, not in terms of starting one, but in sustaining a land trust. And you're absolutely right. The majority of land trusts in Connecticut are all volunteer or close to all volunteer. But we do see more land trusts hiring staff. They are certainly Uh, professionalizing in a really good way. We've done a ton of work over the years at CLCC and making sure that land trusts have the resources that they need to help them professionalize and and do all the things that you just enumerated. And you're right. You know, I think there's a perception that once the land is acquired, that's it. That's the end of it. And what I say is that's just the beginning. The stewardship of the land, making sure that it is protected not only from an ecological standpoint, but also from encroachments and trespassing, making sure that people are connected to the land so that there is a way to not only sustain the land trust through community membership, but also engaging folks so that they become more conscious of the land around them and generating interest in the next generation of conservationists. Their mission to conserve land is one that is uh, entrusted to them in perpetuity. So that's a pretty heavy burden. Now let's talk about two issues that land trusts have to deal with and maybe fend off a little bit in the community. There are some people who say, well, wait a second, you're buying this land, you're a nonprofit, you're taking it off the tax rolls, we don't have access to be able to tax that land anymore. That's issue number one. The other one is, I may be all in favor of conservation and love open space, but not next to my property. And now all of a sudden you're opening it up and people are coming here to hike and camp and do all these fun things. And, you know, gee, I'm getting cars down my road that I never had before. How do land trusts deal with those two issues? Again, you need to emphasize the myriad benefits of land conservation, both in the short term and the long term. When you were talking about conserving land, it's a very good investment What I'm about to say goes to your second question as well, is that, you know, when you have land, and there's plenty of studies that support this, land that is conserved as open space next to particularly residential property, it actually increases property values. And if folks are concerned about, particularly with trails, rail trails are a great example of people getting nervous about converting an old rail bed, for example, into a trail that runs back behind their house because they're worried about all of a sudden people gaining access to it. But what studies have found is that actually by having that public access, it decreases the types of activities that are harmful and increases the good activities. And having people there is almost like self-policing, uh, you know, those areas. You know, increasing property values, like land keeps the taxes lower in town, actually. It costs less to support open space than it does all other types of land uses, particularly when we're talking about residential subdivisions that cost a lot of money when it comes to local services. Again, we can go on and on protecting drinking water and water quality, flood control, food production, reducing air pollution, protecting public health. These are all measurable ecosystem services that save towns and states money and also bring in revenue and bringing in revenue would include of course tourism dollars so there's a lot of statistics around why investing in land is a good one and that we should keep doing that now as we talked about before we started recording podcasts are not great at you know statistics but there is one statistic that i want to wrap up here on 
which is that, you know, as you said, the state of Connecticut, I think it was 1997, set a goal of putting aside 21% of our land. And we're not necessarily completely precisely accurate on where we stand because of all the hosts of issues we've talked about. Can you just sort of now try and put a big bow on this whole story right now? Where are we? What kind of percentage do you think the best number do we have set aside? What are your thoughts on this? You know, I think the challenge of that is the percentage statewide, it's not a one size fits all. In some places, it might be higher, you know, and then it it might be in others. And in some towns, it might not be achievable. That 21% goal, it will take us decades at the rate that we're going. Even with the most generous figures that we have, it will still take decades for us to meet that goal. And you have to query whether we will be able to do that. If we don't increase the pace of conservation and the land is developed at its current rate, whether it would even be possible to do that. So setting a very aggressive uh, percentage as your target is important and keeping that goal for when we want to meet that target uh, as aggressive as possible is also as important. The numbers are that overall we are about 77 percent of the way there in meeting that 21 percent. But that's still at the pace of conservation that we are undertaking right now, it's still decades, decades from meeting that 21% goal. And paint a picture of what too late means. What will life look like? You know, you can imagine if we don't have land to provide us with the types of ecosystem services that they provide now, you know, we'll be a different place. We'll be in, in a different society, both from not only just visually, but also how we feel physically, how we feel mentally, what the quality of our water will be, what the quality of our air will be, how we will be adapting to, if it's even possible at that point, to the climate crisis. I mean, you know, you don't need to hear from me, I'm not a scientist, what they're predicting in terms of the rise in temperature, how fast this planet is warming, and and Connecticut is no exception. We can't go backwards. We have to move forward. And that means protecting as much as we can. And as I said before, a very strategic, a very purposeful way, make sure that we are conserving the most important land that is going to be able to not only continue to provide those services, but perhaps, you know, undo some of the damage that has already been done. Said another way, since we've reached 77 percent of our goal to set aside 21 percent of the state's land, we have a little more than 16% of Connecticut's land formally set aside as open space. Well, that wraps up this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path. Does your town have a land trust? Well, it's easy to find out. Just go to the CLCC website and find their map, which shows which towns have them and which don't. The website, www.ctconservation.org. I want to thank our guest for today's program, Amy Blaymore Patterson, the first and to date only executive director that the Connecticut Land Conservation Council has ever had. The answer to this week's trivia question, the question was, if you were a potential military recruit and you went to see Connecticut's Dr. Beckwith, odds are you were looking for a medical excuse not to go to war. The question was, which war were we talking about? Well, the answer is Dr. Josiah Beckwith was based in Litchfield and he saw recruits during the Civil War and an inordinate number of them got medical deferrals from service. Next week on Amazing Tales CT, we'll look at the backstory and circumstances surrounding the esteemed Dr. Beckwith, a very intriguing story indeed. Amazing Tales from Off and On, Connecticut's Beaten Path is a production of True North Associates, LLC. This is Mike Allen. Be safe and please stay healthy. (laughs) 